Storytelling is one of the most beautiful and meaningful practices known to men. It brings people closer as the one narrating and the ones listening are transported to a whole new world altogether. Some of the oldest stories known to men were passed down through the word of mouth. Storytelling since earlier times have been a cultural and folk activity where people of different age groups all gather to listen fascinating tales of kings, princesses, magicians and talking animals. Storytelling is also a bonding activity between children and adults in a family. We all remember Dadi Ma Kim Kahaniya, right? Or even the bedtime stories our parents told us, which would result in us sleeping with a smile on our faces and fairy tales in our dreams. But is this practice dying out? Is storytelling slowly getting replaced by audiobooks and YouTube videos for kids? Has the world moved on from its need for storytelling or with everything that's going on, does it need it now more than ever? Hello everyone, you're listening to the Socially Desi show, the podcast that motivates you to live, create and inspire. If this is your first time here, welcome. On our show, we discuss tips and strategies with our guest speakers on how to tackle problems related to personal growth, mental health, relationships, business and entrepreneurship and health and fitness. So hit that subscribe button and go check out our website at sociallydesi.com for more of such content. My guest on the show today is Zenia Wadhwani. She is the author of the children's book It Was the Night Before Diwali. Hello Zenia, welcome to the show. Thank you very much Anurag. It's a pleasure to be hosting you on the show today Zenia. So, uh, to our audience who are not aware about you, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a bit about yourself? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, so, my name is Zenia Wadhwani. I live in Toronto, Canada. I am a mom. I uh, work in the area of corporate citizenship for a local company here. I have always been um, a strong lover of books and an advocate for emerging writers um, and have worked on a few um, anthology publications in the past where we have solicited writing from South Asian authors on a number of topics mostly because we just didn't see enough of ourselves in our books that we were reading. So that love has always been there. And after becoming a mom, I realized that that lack of diversity also existed in children's book books. Mm-hmm. And I thought that one day, um, maybe I'll write a book of my own. And so now I am adding author uh, to my list of titles <laughs> um, as, a, as a, a children's author. Wow, that's that's amazing. So how did this whole uh, transition happen for you? Because I remember we spoke about uh, this, you know, before the episode, uh, that this was a passion project for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did this uh, passion project came to life? So I'll go back to about uh, nine years ago around this time. And I was pregnant uh, with my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I was, it was either Diwali or Karbachot, but there was a nice, big fat tray of mitai in front of me Mm -hmm. and I playfully um, picked up the tray and um, pretended I was going to gobble it down and my husband took a photo of that and we laughed (laughs) and I said ah I just look like a mitai monster right here (laughs) and uh and so born the idea that somewhere in there is um is a character that children need to know about and it's a story. And in my head, I guess, um, for those who are familiar with um, the American show um, Sesame Street, you're very familiar with Cookie Monster. And so in my mind's eye, it was the Indian version of Cookie Monster. Here it was Matai Monster. Um, <laughs> so it yeah. took a while to get that uh, that story out. I tried sort of different ideas in terms of the way to introduce this character in a children's book. And I tried a few different stories. And it just to be honest, wasn't coming out in a way that I thought was really impactful and mm. meaningful. Um, until about last year, when I sort of came up with the idea of Twas the Night Before the Bali. And even then, after coming up with the idea, hadn't sort of um, written it out in full um, until the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. And I was furloughed from my job for a few months. And I became uh, a very bad part-time teacher to my daughter who was learning from home. And I thought, no, I'm not meant to be a teacher. Um, I became a, you know, a short ordered cook and a, <laughs> an organizer of everything in my house. And I realized that I needed to turn to one of my long list of things that I want to do. And I can't 
cross the things off my bucket list that are related to travel. But this children's book is still something that's there that I really want to do. Mm -hmm. And so I turned back to it and uh, revisited that idea and what I had jotted down and started um, playing with the, the story a little bit and having it come out. And when I finished, I read it to my husband and I'm, uh, and he, he sort of listened to it and said, you know, I think you've got something here. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I realized I actually did not because he told me I had that idea. I had the confidence in the story itself, but my husband also has his very is very attuned to things that are sort of current and happening and are catchy. He's just got that knack. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that maybe there's something here I can and start pursuing and pushing. That was probably late June, early July. And I thought, well, if we're going to do this this year and the Bali is in November, we have a very short time frame. Yeah. And so I pushed really hard to uh, look for an illustrator, to work on the story, to do a bunch of research in terms of what my options were. Mm -hmm. Because had I gone the traditional route of a uh, traditional publisher, the way it works here anyways in North America is that it can take, you know, once they choose your story, it can take two years to get it on the shelves. Oh. And I wasn't interested in <laughs> waiting for two years. And, uh, I, th you know, the pandemic sort of put priorities into place, so true. right? It yeah. sort of put, uh, yeah, what do I want to really focus my energies on? What does my legacy need to be? Um, and this was one of those. <clears throat> mm. So off I went in search of an illustrator. I found this uh, lovely woman who lives in Quebec, um, whose first language is not English. Um, so we tried to work through a English French sort of translation <laughs> service to okay. um, come up with the story. And she had never worked on anything mm -hmm. that was South Asian related. So oh. for her, she discovered a whole new culture, which was lovely. Um, and she's just got a brilliant talent and a colorful style that I thought that kind of color and vibrancy is exactly what South Asian culture is about. And it actually uh, shows up on the uh, book as well. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when I looked at the book, I, I really saw that vibrant colors of, you know, uh, Southeast Asia and especially India. Uh, when I see that uh, illustration, you know, you can really relate to the kind of feeling and the vibe uh, which Diwali actually gives. It does. So it's it's really well illustrated. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, I especially like the Mithai monster because you know the eyes <laughs> and and the way the ear. You know, one of the ear is hanging outside, one of the ear is at the back. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really interesting, it's you know, cute. to see. <laughs> It's it's really cute. So kudos to you and your illustrator for doing that. I mean, it's really interesting and uh, thank you. Really like the color combination. And also, guys, uh, don't worry. Uh, it's an audio show, but we would definitely be uh, putting a few images of Mithai Monster on our Instagram mm -hmm. page as well as uh, on our website at sociallydesi dot com. So don't get disheartened. <laughs> we'll we'll definitely show <laughs> no, you some uh, some images of Mithai Monster there. So yeah, I mean, uh, a very interesting uh, Zinia to uh, talk about your journey how you started uh, you know uh, started as a cook so which which was uh, the first mithai that you cooked so I, you know i am not i am not a huge mithai maker and in fact i will be honest in telling you that i don't have a huge sweet tooth but there are <laughs> moments i have to admit when i have um this weakness and you know my mother-in-law makes a, a phenomenal kalakand and my mother mm -hmm. um makes this amazing sindhi baro and um coconut burfi and naan kathais that, you know, are the things that I grew up on around mm -hmm. the Bali. And so while I haven't gotten into a huge habit of making Matai, I do make some sweets. Um, I feel also that um, my daughter actually has quite a bit of a sweet tooth too. And so I have to sort of feel like I need to manage sometimes the amount yeah. of sweet and sugar that's in the house. And so trying to look for some Sometimes healthier options, but quite honestly, let's, you know, this is a time I think of a little bit of indulgence and uh, it's fun to see such gorgeous Matai that, um, that you can see in the stores these days. And, and yeah. it's hard not to be a Matai monster yourself and want to gobble them all up. So true. <laughs> Hence the Matai monster. Yes, hence the Matai monster who makes uh, <laughs> who makes her debut in this story and and really is 
sort of a fun loving character who, you know, it's the story is set at, at the time of the volley, obviously, and a family is celebrating and, and she sort of makes her way onto the scene as this little un, uninvited guest yeah. who comes and, you know, Matai start disappearing and, and how, where did this Matai go? But, you know, the realization or the story tells that, you know, this is a, this is a character who is auspicious and is playful and is, um, fun. And so that's, I think, the idea that I really wanted to get across to children is that this is just, you know, where Christmas has Santa Claus, we can have Matai Monster and um, and have fun with that. So true. I mean, I completely agree with that because we need a mascot right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. And uh, so uh, we'll come back to the Matai Monster and the book uh, in a while, but I would like to... Uh, you know, step back a bit and talk about the initial phase of the lockdown. Like you said, you know, you were mm-hmm. at home and you thought of, you know, st- uh, you know, let's cook something and then you tried to teach your kids as well. So, you know, even you were trying a lot of things and that that was the reality for a lot of people in the world where they they were trying to do something and try to, uh, you know, understand what the whole thing is happening, why it's happening and how they can actually, you know, uh, go through this whole pandemic situation. And, uh, When we talk about these stories, we are only focusing on adults, right? We are focusing Mm -hmm. on people who have lost their jobs or maybe who have lost a dear one. We are always talking about, uh, you know, the adults. What about the kids? And this is what we want to focus on this episode where we want to, uh, you know, from your uh, point of view, understand what was the impact on kids, uh, especially during this whole pandemic situation. What what were your experiences as a mom when you saw your kids or, you know, your uh, neighbor's kids, your friend's kids? What was the whole situation like and how did it, uh, you know, go down for the kids in your household? You know, it's it's such an excellent question, Anurag, because it's um, we have been really focused on on the impact on adults and on the, and you know sort of the overall impact on families. And we think, you know, kids are quite resilient, um, but there is no question that this pandemic has had a profound impact on children and um, will likely have a, an impact on them for for most of their lives. Now. Mm. Obviously, I cannot speak as a you know professional psychologist for children. I cannot speak for all children by any means, um, but I will caveat by saying that you know children children's experiences will depend in great part by the support of their parents, by their socioeconomic status, um, by the resources that are available to them. Um, all of those things will have a great impact. You know, I think for my daughter, who I can who I can speak for is, um, you know, we, I have to acknowledge that we are in a, in a privileged situation. My daughter goes to a, a, you know, a private school, um, where they really stepped up. They were able to react very quickly. They got the kids back online. They tried to engage them to the best of their abilities. Mm -hmm. And yes, there were struggles all the way around for parents who are working and trying to manage their kids. And and I'll be honest that I was not at my best. There were days when I was certainly not at my best, um, to, to much to my um, disappointment. But I think it was that each one of us was sort of trying to struggle and figure this out in their own way. I think there were moments when we tried to sort of make the best of it by, you know, really humor is a big thing for us. So we infuse yeah. humor and we sort of look at some of those memes that are online and, <laughs> and how are we all managing? Um, and then try to make it a bit of a, you know, an adventure um, or, you know, for the kids to understand what is this about and what is important that we are learning from this, uh, this, this situation that is not just happening to us, but happening to everyone around the world. But also, you know, it's about what I said earlier about figuring out priorities. It's about um, reframing the situation to understand how we should be, for what we need to be grateful for. So there were a lot of conversations around that um, in our house. Mm -hmm. And we really relied on looking at what are our friends doing? What are our neighbors doing? In our neighborhood, they were quite um, lovely in that they started doing things for kids by saying, look, if the kids can't go out, let's get the kids to work on a different themed activity every day and put something up in the windows. What sort of activities were these? 
So mostly crafts, right? So for example, they would say, okay, today's theme is flowers. Mm -hmm. Um, Have the kids create something out of, um, you know, construction paper and glue and and all the crafts that you have at home. And then show that picture in your window, tape it to your window so that when we go for a walk, because many families were still getting out with their families to go for walks, that was actually Mm -hmm. increasing. um, They could go around to the different houses and see sort of the pretty pictures in the window. So the, you know, one week it would be that, or, and then the next day, it, you know, the next week it would be, um, you know, around Easter time, they would be, it would be Easter eggs and bunnies. And then they would choose another theme and they would say, you know, today it's balloons or tomorrow it's unicorns. And <clears throat> so it gave an activity for the kids to do. It pushed them outside to get outside and go for a walk. And I think to recognize that they are not alone in this, this right. circumstance, in this situation, that there is still a shared experience here for each of these kids, even though they can't really hang out together. Um, hmm. So that was, that was done as well. And we, you know, we tried to make do with, um, you know, virtual play dates, uh, tried to increase those as much as possible. I have an only child. <clears throat> so I have this added um, thought process that goes into, there is no other young playmate for her in my household. Right. Uh, you know, we live with my mother-in-law. We have that added benefit of, um, you know, another person that she can, hang out with and, and engage with. But in terms of children, that's another different kind of experience. And so we really had to be all that much more conscious about how do we do this in a safe way. Hmm. And slowly here in Toronto, you know, things would open up a little bit. <clears throat> the rules relaxed a little bit. We were able to say, okay, one or two families, let's connect outdoors in a big open space and let the kids hang out for a bit. You know, we would do things like that. We did um, a fun <laughs> experiment one day where we turned our the driveway into our house. We took some chalk and we made a life size um, snakes and ladders game. Wow! You know, we and then invited the neighbors to come and 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 play on our driveway when we weren't there. And so, you know, there were different sort of things that we we came up with to to engage ourselves to. Um, to keep the creativity alive, to keep the fun alive. Um, but always remind ourselves that there's, there, it's hard not to remind yourself that this is still uh, very present in our lives and how our lives are different now. So true. I mean, I mean, this is the power of a community, right? At the end of the day, if you guys can uh, be together and do something or the other to make sure that your kids are actually, you know, getting some sort of an activity and uh, they are not idle at home. Because uh, like, especially in India, when this whole lockdown situation happened, a lot of families had this issue where uh, their kids had nothing to do, right? And uh, Right. You see, I mean, in, in metropolitan cities in India, you have apartments, everybody is cramped up into two mm-hmm. BHKs, three BHKs, right? And uh, during the lockdown, it was so hard that you can't even go outside your house. Right. And you can't even access the lifts. Forget about even, you know, going outside to the park. Mm-hmm. So uh, a lot of parents had this issue uh, of, you know, what to do. I mean, uh, it's a small apartment. You have your kids at home, nothing to do. The kids can't go out. Right. And uh, then this whole situation happened where uh, the school started doing the online classes. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, like what I feel, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, when the online classes started, I actually think that a lot of kids, when like especially the younger ones, uh, they must have felt weird. Like as in my friend is in front <laughs> of me. Right. right. He's across the screen. He's sitting there. Like, of course, kids these days are way tech savvy than we were. Yes, but they are. But but still, I mean, they would see their friend, their best friend across the screen, but they can't meet him. Right. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, screen time went up big time, right? Like just in terms mm. of even how parents were managing was saying, you know, we need to be a little bit looser on our rules in terms of the amount of screen time we can give our children because it is a way for all of us to cope. And so, yeah. yes, the, the screen time increased. I think, you know, certainly when my daughter saw her kids um, on screen, I mean, I think she's used enough to the screen that that wasn't so jarring, but I think it actually brought a little bit of joy to be able mm. to see the other kids there because if she couldn't see them in person, at least she could connect with them online. Mm. Um, so that was really important for her. Um, but it's it's interesting, you know, I mean, I, and I'm certainly not one of the only parents who 
experienced this, but, you know, particularly with an only child, we got a little bit of the guilt trip of her being an only child and, and uh, being reminded of that. And, um, so we kind of got suckered into, to getting a new puppy, uh, during this COVID (laughs) period, which a lot of, um, families around here also, uh, have been doing. And so that has added, um, a little, a lot of work, but Mm. quite a bit of joy also to how we have coped with this, uh, with this situation. But yes, the screen, uh, is, is unavoidable too. (laughs) Yeah, and and with this whole, you know, in the start of the episode, like I said, uh, with this whole audiobooks and YouTube uh, for kids, you know, you have kids watching all these stories uh, on a video platform, right? Mm-hmm. They're consuming content uh, through a video, uh, you know, audio visual uh, medium, you know. So now my next question to you is, what is the impact of storytelling on the life of a child? Like, you know, when I talk about storytelling, there are two sorts of like storytelling that you can do generally what uh, kids they experience. One is the the story that they see on their textbook. Yeah. Right. And the other, uh, the other side of the story is, is the book, like it was the night before Diwali. So Mm -hmm. uh, something like a book, which is dedicated to a story. Right. So what is the difference uh, of storytelling in both of these mediums? You know, my my immediate thought is that, you know, when a child thinks that they're looking at a textbook, they're, the, the immediate reaction is, um, this is something I have to do. Hmm. Um, I'm supposed to be learning something from it. And I'm not sure if I want to do it, right? It's, hmm. it's a different kind of experience. It's usually a textbook. And there's, you know, there's some ass- assignment that's attached to it, or there are some kind of questions that need to go with it. Whereas, you know, a book of one's own to sort of, dive into a story is, you know, I just, I don't even know the best words to describe it, but it's this, it's a place for one's imagination to go, right? It is just Mm. a brilliant um, opportunity for a child to get lost, to, um, you know, experience something different. And the brilliance about it all is that they're in all likelihood learning something anyways, um, but don't necessarily feel that they that they are. You know, there's a lot of research about the value of reading in children and a lot of research in the value of children having their own little libraries, as we would call them, their own little Mm -hmm. bookshelves full of their own books. And what that does for children in terms of their reading comprehension, their reading ability, their level of um, success in school, all of that. There's tons of studies around that kind of stuff. And in fact, I I'm very privileged to sit on a local charitable organization here in Toronto called the Children's Book Bank that okay. um, takes children's books from um, kids who have them. They're, you know, they've grown out of those books and those books are donated. And then they take those books and they give them to kids who can't afford to um, have their own libraries. Um, and it's all in this promotion of literacy and this promotion of the love of reading. And it is such a brilliant, it's such a small operation, such a brilliant thing that, that it does. Um, that it goes back again to that research that shows that if these children who are, um, you know, are not as resourced, are, are not as privileged to have what some, many of us take for granted as having books in our homes, right. that they are able to build those libraries of their own and what that does, what that does for an individual. So that story in its own book, you know, if it's a picture book at a young age, mm-hmm. the illustrations that go with that story, um, you know, when you get older and the illustrations are lost, but even older children and how you can completely get lost in another character in another world. Um, you know, Harry Potter is a brilliant example of, yep. of um, you know, a book series that, that did that not only for children, but for adults. Um, but it actually has, you know, a really good book. Some, you know, you get into it, it has actually proven to reduce stress levels. Like, you know, it, even as little, I think I read something the other day that said, you know, as, as little as six minutes a day yeah. um, can reduce your stress by like 60% or something like that. And it just eases your muscle tension. It takes your mind into a, a sort of a different place. And there's, you know, reading really involves a fair amount of complex circuits and signals in the brain, right? Like it, it requires a lot. And so it does a lot for you. And the research on this kind of stuff is actually quite fascinating. I mean, it's certainly not the reason why I wrote a book, but it is lovely to know that the benefits of doing that, um, 
are, are far beyond, you know, the joy of simply being able to see yourself in a story, which is one of the big reasons why I did it is that as my daughter looked through all her books, did she see someone that was the same color as her? And perhaps in India, this is probably not um, as much of an issue uh, because of the, the books that you have. But in North America, when we look at the books that that children are buying here or that in the, are in the major bookstores, a lot of them do not have reflections of kids that look like them. Um, so this was, this was a really, really, really important part for me, um, that I needed to, I needed to show her that in this book. So true. And, uh, one of the things that you, uh, spoke about, which really caught my eye was, uh, imagination right so mm -hmm. unlocking your imagination through these books through these illustrations through the whole experience of storytelling that was really interesting because even i feel that uh, you know the the current education system that you have the kind of textbook uh, knowledge that you're imparting to the kids right the storytelling in those textbook is not I, I i don't know but it's not unlocking the true potential of the imagination of a child mm -hmm. this is what i feel and this is where you know you rightly said that uh, these book clubs and uh, uh, these illustrative books where you can actually trans you know transport yourself to a different world to a magical world just like harry potter right and mm -hmm. the, why harry potter was so successful because like you said it not only captured the imagination of a child but also somebody who is in the late 30s or 40s because yeah, they can yeah. also transport themselves to the world of hogwarts and you know go through yeah, that right. nine and three quarters right you know they can go through that and experience a different world altogether so i guess th that is one of uh, the the important aspects of the future of education this is what i see is uh, introducing the concept of uh, having these kind of uh, storybooks, these kind of illustrative imaginary world experience for the kids where they can actually mm -hmm. read these kind of books in schools. Because I remember uh, when I was a kid, I was studying in class 7 or 8. I, I was in a school uh, in uh, Shillong in India. Mm -hmm. uh, so... There, uh, I was studying in this school called St. John's Whitehall and they had uh, they had a library, okay, for all the kids. And we used to have a couple of library periods in the week. So we used to go there and the only thing was like, go inside the library, read books for the whole 45 minutes. And if you want to take anything home, you can take that, just enter uh, enter it in the uh, log sheet and you're good to go. And my my mm -hmm. favorite, like there, there were so many books out there, but the one book that I still remember uh, like the one that I actually would, uh, you know, uh, take home almost every month, uh, uh was the Goosebumps by R. L. Stein. Uh, that <laughs> right. series, because uh, the 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 thing that fascinated me the most uh, uh about Goosebumps was the the freedom to choose the path for your character, because that's right. how the books were laid out. And I would specifically choose those editions which would have that, you know, decide the fate of the character, decide the uh, way, right. the story, how it will go. So that fascinated me. For for a lot of other kids, maybe, you know, some other books fascinated them. A lot of my friends used to read Shakespeare and all. That, that was interesting. Right. But for me, that was something that captured my attention, my imagination. So this is, this is my, uh, you know, perspective of the world right now that we should have these kind of um, uh, institutional setups uh, inside the schools where they can actually go pick up a book, you know, decide for themselves what they want to read. And maybe that that would be something that, you know, they'll remember for the rest of their life, like I do right now. Oh, for sure. I know, you know, like you bring up a really, really um, important thing that there is one thing to be able to get lost in a book, mm. but being able to tell a story is quite something else that has um, such a, such power for children. I remember being in um, school and I think it was in grade six mm -hmm. and um, we had um, a guest come into the, into the classroom to help us write stories. And so we would write these, uh, we would write these stories and then she would tell us, you know, you use this word a lot. And, and it was just this explanation of, of how to tell a tale. Mm -hmm. Um, that ha I have never forgotten her visit to that school and how it made me want to think about, uh, about telling stories. And there are actually, um, for parents who are listening in, um, you know, a number of toys and, um, and, you know, we think we, we always get these 
these things for our kids. And I, and I always secretly, maybe it's not so good, but you know, I secretly try to find <laughs> where, where's the educational opportunity mm. for my child in, the, in this toy. Um, but we uh, once received a gift from a friend and uh, the one that we got was called Adventures in Storyland. But okay. there are, are many v- different versions of, of, you know, these kinds of books. But it was brilliant in that it um, it was a bunch of storyboards. So there's just uh, board markers that you would take out and each board had a different scene. So one was the jungle, one was, um, you know, the Arctic, one was a beach, Mm -hmm. um, one was a house, sort of one was a palace. They had different sort of settings. And then they had three sets of cards. So one card set was characters. One card set is objects. And the other card set is um, creatures or something, you know, unique and different. Hmm. Okay. And the idea is you pull up one of the boards, you take out a random character, you take out a random object, and you take out a random creature, and you put them on the, the board, and you get kids to start telling a story based on what they see. Hmm. And what that does for children is it just really lets their imagination go. I have a police officer on a beach with a um, a laptop and the creature is, um, you know, maybe it's a monkey. So now (laughs) where does my story go with that? Where does it start? Where does Mm. it end? Um, But I, I thought this was such a wonderful, wonderful gift that we had received. And we certainly used it many times uh, with my daughter and with her friends in sort of just bringing that out and letting the imagination go. Um, so I would, I would encourage like there, yes, getting lost in a book is, is so wonderful. Um, but maybe just maybe if there could be more people taking a chance to write their stories or write different stories, uh, wouldn't that be wonderful too? So true. Yeah. And, and this is something that can only happen with books. huh? I mean, you cannot get lost in a video. Like whatever, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you get lost in a very different way. Yeah, I mean that's like you know you you have you, you like the video will have your attention for the next thirty minutes or forty minutes. That's it. But a yeah. book will actually you know be in your dreams. The book will actually captivate you. You know, until the time you are thinking about it, and for years, it's true. Right, it's true, and. And it is amazing what books can do, right? Like mm. they, uh, they can take you away into a story. They actually have this means of strengthening your brain power. They, you know, invoke this ability to increase your empathy yep. in stories. Yep. Um, they can actually, like I said, they can reduce yourself, but they can help you sleep. They can, um, you know, and there have been studies that show that they alleviate depression. Mm. You know, there's, you know, they, they prevent cognitive decline. They, you know, it's evident that they build your vocabulary. The, the value of books um, is just, is, is beyond words. It truly is um, in terms of what it is able to offer up for, for not only for children, but for all of us. And I think now, if you think about this time that we're going through and what it is that we are turning to the most we are turning to artists. Yep. We are turning to artists in terms of the movies that we are watching. We are turning to artists even in terms of the gaming or whatever we're doing. And we are certainly turning to artists in terms of the music that we're listening to and the books that we're reading. Artists have really, in many ways, um, held us together. They have brought us a coping mechanism um, that is... Uh, that is, you know, is, is very profound. It's, it's just amazing what those things, and I can't imagine how any of us would be managing through this time in our lives uh, without those things. I 100% agree with that. And uh, this is something that uh, we need to bring in more uh, in our day-to-day lives, in our day-to-day discussions where, you know, parents should talk about this. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. even though the screen time has, screen time has gone up, but Still, I mean, there are ways that you can, um, you know, uh, get involved with your kids and, you know, get them into this habit of reading a book or just enjoying their favorite character through a book, right? Rather than having somebody who is on the screen, have something which is in front of you, uh, you know, a paper that you can feel, you can read, you can see. I guess that's a very different experience. Touching it. Yep. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think, you know, for parents listening, you will... You will know that joy that you have felt the first time that your child read out loud to you. Hmm. And you will likely have that joy when you, if you've ever watched them read, to see their faces um, 
you know, react to stories. Yep. Watch your children. It's, it is, it is amazing. Like I clearly remember my daughter reading um, part of the Harry Potter series and her reaching the end of a chapter and her mouth just gaped open in surprise and shock. And I thought that in a moment in and of itself is the brilliance of books. Right? Yes. And his ability to just make you go, oh, <laughs> or wow, or just feel good, or whatever emotion it is, or cry. Like there's just there's there's just so much there. So true. I, I agree with that. So what are the future plans for Mitai Monster? Oh <laughs> <laughs> um I would I would love to keep writing. Um I will tell you that um because this was a personal personal um passion project um and my personal dollars that were invested into it, um I will still need a little bit of time to recoup the um <laughs> the, the financial investment that I've made in it. But that certainly isn't why I why I did the book. But um it, you know, before I can make that that kind of next investment, I think I'm going to need to sort of see how this does, learn mm. a lot from the process in terms of how I was able to get the word out and, and get people reading the book. But yeah, there's lots of ideas in my head in terms of where Matai Monster goes next. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually would love to hear from your um, your audience and others in terms of their ideas for Matai Monster. I think that would be brilliant. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, that she has a lot of legs. She has a lot of adventures that she still needs to go through. Um, and I'm just jotting all of those ideas right down right now. And, and hopefully we'll turn that into another story not in the not too distant future. No, our, our audience will definitely give you their feedback once they read the book. And uh, <laughs> the Socially Desi audience is really, really engaging in that sense because we we had uh, another author. Uh, she was a friend of mine who came to the episode. Um, so, you know, uh, we we spoke about her novel as well. And so tell us, uh, tell us about the book and where can uh, our audience go and uh, check it out? Sure. I mean, because it's self-published, the only place to get it on right now is Amazon. Um, so if you're lucky enough to um, have a Kindle Unlimited um, uh, membership, uh, then you, you can actually read the book for free. Um, but otherwise, uh, you can get uh, an, e- an e-book version um, for quite uh, quite affordable. And um, and then there's the paperback version, which is also available on Amazon. And um as seeing as we're uh, not too far away from the volley now, um, if you've got uh, Prime, then you can get it even faster and uh, be able to read it with your children just uh, just as the volley is arriving. Perfect, perfect. So, guys, definitely check out mithaimonster.com as well as we'll put we'll be putting the Amazon links in the show notes below, uh, as well as uh, Xenia's profile and the uh, Mithai Monster profile will be there on our page at sociallydesi.com. Don't forget to check that out. And with that, again, uh, Xenia, thank you very much for being on the show. It it's it's been a lovely experience speaking about the whole uh, you know experience of kids and this whole pandemic situation and how storytelling actually impacts the life of a child. So thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It was an absolutely lovely conversation with you. Thank you so much, Anurag. So that wraps it up for today, folks. If you liked the episode, give it a big thumbs up, share it with your friends and let's go viral. Remember, our weekly podcast features episodes on personal growth, mental health, relationships, business and entrepreneurship and health and fitness. We would love to have Xenia on our show again in the future to discuss more about the beautiful world of storytelling and the Mithai monster. So if you haven't yet done so, hit that subscribe button and go check out our website at sociallydesi.com. And as always, before I sign off, remember, life is black and white and everything in between.